Um, I have to ask this, Christina. President Obama, can you talk a little bit about his policies and June 15th of this year? I think that was an important day for a lot of people. And uh, I also read recently that you know he has deported more people in two years than throughout the entire Bush administration. So what do you think, friend or foe of immigration? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, one thing um, that I would like to highlight here is that DREAMers are ready and we have been always doing the work of holding everybody accountable mm -hmm. to what we're fighting for. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat and I may like some of the progressive values that, you know, <laughs> we share. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican. If you're going to be with us, then you're going to fight with us, and you're going to stand with us on this issue. And both parties have failed to do that in, in, in big ways. And I think that the, the lack of action on behalf of Congress and leadership I think from President Obama has really created the space and the conditions for Arizona's SB 1070, show me your papers law, right? Alabama's recent anti-immigrant policy as well for folks like Joe Arpaio in Arizona to basically run his, basically this, you know, Arizona as if, he's, if it was his country and his district and just detaining people left and right, with reason or no reason. Um, so that has really, the inaction has really created this space for the anti-immigrant fever that we are facing. And I think that from um, the immigrant youth perspective and our work, it's not only Obama's fault. And it's not only the Democrats' fault or the Republicans all of us, including our own communities, that us, we, you know, I've been organizing since I was 19. We've been organizing around the DREAM Act for over 10 years, some of us, and you know, still, I don't have my aunt and my uncle marching with me when I'm at a rally. Um, so I think that, um, you know, when we want to sort of play the blame game, I think that it's, it, all of us have a stake on, on that. Um, and indeed, um, President Obama, under his administration, we've had high record numbers of deportations. I think on the belief, I think from his administration, that that's going to create some attraction for Republicans to work with him on immigration reform. Um, but really breaking families apart, hurting communities, and most of all, failing to follow up on campaign promises like he's done with many other issues. Um, so I think that for us, um, the victory that, that was very historical for immigrant communities in the entire nation on June 15, when um, after many years of organizing, we pushed hard enough when everybody, including folks within our own movement that told us you cannot push for the DREAM Act as a standalone bill in Congress in 2010, DREAMers said, we are going to show you all that what you define as impossible is possible. And we kept pushing, and we got the DREAM Act to be actually voted in the House of Representatives. It passed the House of Representatives, and it fell in the Senate by five votes, a combination of, again, both Republicans and Democrats. Um, and I think that that's the spirit that we kept, even after the DREAM Act fell. Yes, there were tears. Yes, we were heartbroken. But it was that day when we said we are not going to stop fighting. And it was right after that moment that we held strategy sessions all across the country with the, our own legal research. We continued to mobilize, had actions about coming out stories, um, and decided that we needed to push for a campaign 
that will stop the deportation of undocumented youth. And that is, I think, the, the turning point in our movement where we felt that there was a chance that we could push this administration to give some level of relief for our communities. And so on June 15, after tons of work and mobilizing hundreds of people across the country um, in over 20 states, we have affiliates um, in about 30 states, it's that President Obama announced that um, his administration will grant defer action, which really means they will stop deporting dreamers that meet certain criteria that basically comes from language of the Dream Act bill, um, and that they will grant a work permit um, for two years. So it's, it's, it's historical because it, it's a change in, in a wave of anti-immigrant policies that for us, it's a, it's a huge win since 1986, right? So it, it, I think it's very, it's meaningful, but I think that for us, the work continues. Mm -hmm. This is a very small change in our road for justice mm -hmm. uh, for our communities. And we know that this is just a first step to continue to build on this victory. The non, I mean, you know, rec despite of the fact that it's a victory and, and it's going to benefit um, about 1.4 million undocumented youth, there's just still a lot of young people that were left out. Absolutely. Um, I, I understand, Jose, you were left oh. out of that <laughs> yes. by four months, right? Four months. <laughs> so it's, it's a great victory, and, and a lot of people are celebrating, but I think, as you're saying, it doesn't, it doesn't it's not the full fix yet. It's exactly. not the full reform exactly. yet that we, we really need. Um, it's not permanent. And it isn't permanent, exactly. And Karen, I'd love to turn to you right now and just ask you, you know, about election year politics impacting the immigration debate. Do you think that's happening? And if so, and, and what kinds of reform do you recommend? And if anybody else wants to jump in on that reform question, please do. And then we're going to take actually a couple of questions from the audience. Alex, I don't know, did you pass out? Um, did people get comment cards that they could write their questions on? If you if you did, great, you could write them down. Otherwise, we'll take a couple from the from the floor after we hear from Karen and then and then Rinku. Um, so yeah, uh, does the um, election year politics affect um, the immigration debate? Yes, I mean it's it's not a coincidence that um, you know President. Obama came into office with great promises of mm -hmm. pushing for reform. And um, ultimately, you know, Congress was clearly not going to work with him. And there's a certain degree, you know, he didn't take maybe the leadership role that he could have and should have. And so there was this sense of him not fulfilling his campaign promises. He, he talked the talk, but ultimately, the action didn't follow, mm -hmm. and so the the campaign that has been waged over the past, um, I guess I don't know, 16, 18 months when we, um, so it was you know the Dreamers pushing Dream Acts related and 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 ex administrative actions that can help Dreamers, and then sort of a broader campaign asking for executive action because it's not that he would be overriding Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and not ref re respecting the division of responsibilities that, you know, between executive, legislative, and judiciary branches. There are things as a chief executive that you do have executive power over and policies that you can um, take. And there are things within his power that can help to undo some of the damage of a very long time broken immigration system, which has only become more so under this administration. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what was so significant was that he finally moved from words to actual action. Mm -hmm. And it's limited, but it's, I think it's hugely significant in that. And I do think it's election year politics. And the fact that the Latino and immigrant vote is becoming a major make it or break it factor for elections across the country, mm -hmm. um, that it, you just can't ignore that that is the you know basically it is the growing political presence of immigrant slash latino voters um 
So um, yes, I would say it's definitely played into it. It's playing it, the sort of um, election year politics has, is what's behind the sort of hand wringing within, say, the Republican Party. Um, because they did what they did to mobilize their base, primary mm -hmm. season, and now, now they have to, you know, deal with the general election and ultimately, for those who enter into power, um, serving a broader constituency, um, how do they sort of get away from the really vitriolic kind of stuff that was being peddled, that was feeding red meat to a very sort of extreme kind of faction? Mm -hmm. and, and somehow make it more um, sort of, you know, r reflective of less rabid kind of sentiments. Um, so um, I'd say that the election, uh, not just election year politics, but the, the sort of future reality of what our electorate in this country is and will be plays a huge role. Um, and then in terms of the reforms, um, I mean, the most immediate is obviously deal with the fact that we have over 10 million people here without um, status. And so it, it's addressing that, providing some path to citizenship, um, you know, accepting that this is not something that you can deport away. You, you have 80% of immigrant families are mixed status. Um, so they're part of our communities, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just extricate the undocumented wholesale and the problems resolved, because you will tear apart communities left and right. Um, and, you know, aside from the logistics of doing it, which are impossible. Um, so you have to provide a path to citizenship. Um, you have to get rid of the backlogs. Um, a lot of the people who are here without status actually have pending claims that they're viable, that, that are viable, that allow, will allow them to live here. But this terrible backlog. So, you know, some parent comes over here, they, they sponsor their child, the child's five years old. They're not gonna see that child till he might be deep into the throes of adolescence. Um, that's a huge sort of like sacrifice to make. And I don't think it's not understandable that people might choose to stay together while they wait for papers to come through. So there has to be some dealing with the backlog. There has to be um, an immigration system that reflects our economic and labor needs. Um, most of our economic growth over the past decade was in fields that um, relied on less skilled labor. Like 98% of our growth was in sectors that relied heavily on less skilled labor. We grant 5,000 immigration visas for low-skilled workers, 5,000 a year, when you're talking about sectors that employ millions upon millions upon millions of people. There's a reason why you have a lot of undocumented low-wage workers in this country. Um, so you have to have a system that you know, reflects our labor needs. And Ultimately, you have to have enforcement that makes sense, that is not inhumane. Our enforcement system, mm -hmm. you know, from 96 on particularly, is um, it, it's punitive, it's unforgiving, it's applied retroactively. Um, so an 18-year-old kid can have a joint, get picked up. 20 years later, they're coming back from their parents' funeral, they're not let back into the country because they have a criminal conviction. Mm -hmm. And this is the category of serious criminals that are ostensibly being targeted. So we need an enforcement system where there's due process, there's judicial review, where there's not mandatory deportation and detention, where there's absolutely no leeway in how a judge can um, act on a case. Um, am I forgetting anything? Just tough Great. to make it easier for people to move around. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Rinku, just before we move on to taking some questions from the audience, uh, I just want to sort of tie back into the arts and culture um, aspect of, of moving this debate forward. And I just wanted to ask you, how do you think that storytelling, the arts, and journalism can really change the nature of the discourse around immigration? And what stories have the power to move policy? And, and Finally, I just want to add into that, do you think that what Jose did in coming out so publicly has shifted 
the discourse? Is that one of the stories that has the power to move policy? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I want to focus on stories. Um, this applies to images, to so to visual art. Mm -hmm. But um, I want to talk for a minute about why stories are important. It really has to do with the way that the human brain functions. And all of you can imagine that human beings love stories. That's the reason that Hollywood is the industry that it is worldwide. Uh, the brain is actually geared towards stories. And in our brains, we have uh, what are called frames. We have dominant frames. They're ways of looking at the world and categorizing people and thinking through what's correct and what's not correct. And so in, in our brains, we hold a dominant frame, but there's also another frame, a competing frame. So if I said to this audience, if I said, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, how many of you would know what I meant? Raise your hand if you know what I mean. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And if I said to you, the Good Samaritan, how many of you would know what I meant by the Good Samaritan? So pretty much, you know, 90, it's actually hard for me to see the audience because the lights are <laughs> shining in our eyes, but, uh, you know, hefty. But how many of you have actually read a Horatio Alger story? Horatio Alger. So far fewer people have read the story than knew what the phrase meant. And that is because human beings have been hearing a version of that story since we walked the earth and could talk. Some version of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And we've also been hearing a version of the Good Samaritan story. So they're both actually hardwired into our brains, into the, um, the cell matter, the gray matter of our brains. Now, which story is most important to you, you as a human being you know, alive at this moment, has to do with which story got reinforced in your brain the most while you were growing up. So if you got a lot of like bootstraps messaging, then that's gonna be your dominant frame. But the other one is gonna be in there too. So our job is to trigger the frame that, is the, that helps open people up to the kinds of policy solutions that need to be made. And you can't do it, you can't trigger a frame with facts or data. When the brain hears a fact that, or a piece of data that contradicts its dominant frame, it throws away the fact. It does not throw away the frame. And you can, you can sort of understand why that would happen. You know, people lie to us to get us to do things like give them our meat or, you know, let them sit by our fire or whatever. So, you know, from evolution, the brain has developed to dismiss things that don't make sense to it. And the only way you can trigger the other frame is not with a fact or a number, but with a story or an image or an archetype. It's, um, that's the part of the brain that holds the frame. And so a really big mistake that many advocates make and that I think was, the, um, was a driving force in the immigrant rights movement until about 2008 when, um, or 2009, I guess, when comprehensive immigration reform really died as a possibility. <laughs> like, it was gone. There was no uh, fighting for it now. Once it died, um, the movement began to try some other things. Before it died, uh, our response, you know, our interventions were very technical. You know, this is the way that, um, uh, legalization would work and these are the real numbers and these are these this is the amount of taxes that undocumented people pay it was like number 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 but we're talking to brains that have that are geared to throw away those numbers you all see what I'm saying right why that would be a strategy that would not work so if you look at our Shattered Families report, that report only has one number in it, and it has like 30 stories. So it's laid out, story, 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 a number. Story, 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 the same number again. Uh, story, 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 same number for the third time. So I work for the Applied Research Center. Numbers are important, data is very important. Um, like Jose, I'm trained as a journalist, so I believe in facts and what actually happens, but um, but I have come to a place where I really um, take a story and image-based approach to um, most things because I'm not just trying to consolidate the people who already think like me, who will be encouraged by the number. They can absorb lots of numbers because they're all numbers that reinforce 
their Good Samaritan frame or Welcome Thy Neighbor frame or you know whatever good frame they have. Um, so that's why stories are important. It's actually because of the way the human brain works. And we can you know, complain about um, anti-immigrant forces and how irrational they are, but they're no more irrational than we are. We're just as irrational because we are operating off of a dominant frame. Now, I think that all the storytelling that has been happening over the last four years, three to four years, the dreamers coming out is a big part of that. Jose coming out is um, a particularly prominent form of that. Um, the people that we interviewed for our Shattered Families report coming out, big, big part of that. I think it's starting to have an effect. I was on, um, I was on uh, um, Chris Hayes' show in November, late November, and um, Roy Beck was on the same show. He did a remote, remote interview. Roy Beck is the head of Numbers USA, which is the third leg on the anti-immigrant kind of national organization stool. Numbers USA has hundreds of thousands of members, probably millions of members, who write to Congress every day saying, don't give amnesty to those people. And um, on that show, Roy Beck, in his five minute interview, he did not use the word illegal one time. And he said, um, he said, you know, people who are here uh, without papers, I think, are, you know, trying to take care of their families and they're enterprising. They're not mostly here to commit crimes. They're not terrorists. This is Roy Beck saying this. And he was saying it because he, he's smart and he understands that, um, that, uh, we are in danger, the conservative side on the immigration debate is actually in danger of losing because people are starting to be, influ feel in be influenced by um, all of the story, by their actual experience of uh, immigration policy as it stands now. He also said on that show that you know people say mass deportation or mass legalization are the only solutions, and those are not the only two solutions. First time I ever heard him say that mass deportation was not some kind of solution. So I, I do think we're making progress, and I do think that storytelling and the art that um, dreamers like Julio Salgado have done and others have done, um, having the storylines appear in movies, the film The Visitor, I think, was an important moment, et cetera. All those things give Americans um, an end to the issue that they don't get without the story and without the art. Thank you, Rinku. That was really fantastic. <laughs> so uh, we're just, we'll take a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Um, why is this society more accepting of young dreamers who have assimilated than of those who have come here later in their lives? Does anybody want to tackle that one? I, well, okay. I, I, I get this a lot. Um, well, first of all, I'm Asian, so we're used to the whole eight, you know, minority. What is it? Perfect minority. What is model. it? Model minority. You I'm don't sorry. even know the label. I'm sorry. I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> but I get labeled by so many things. When it's like I have to like figure out which one I'm being labeled by. Um, like I remember when I first came out, came out, um, and I had I did an event, and this wonderful kid stood up and said, "What if?" Like, Jose, like, I don't think I'm as smart as you are. <laughs> he was like, you know, like, are you saying that only people who have a Pulitzer Prize and have gone to college and speak English like you, are you only the ones that, I, you know? I remember when we were first launching, when I was orchestrating coming out, and we were gonna do a press release, because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And my co-founders, you know, prepare the press release and they said, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists. And I fought my friends. I'm like, let's take that out. And one of my friends is Jamu Green, who used to run Rock the Vote mm -hmm. and the Women's Media Center, one mm -hmm. of my dearest friends. And she goes, what are you talking about? Well, because I don't want people to think that just because I'm this, I'm more special than like other people. You know, I don't want to send that message. Jose, she was, she was making the argument that if we don't put that there, no one's gonna care. And this gets us to this frame that Rinka was talking about mm -hmm. in terms of the, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. there, uh, she was making the argument, and of course she was right, mm -hmm. that an archetype, that we needed an archetype. Yeah. 
Exactly. That there needed to be some sort of something that pushed against, because at the end of the day, you know, my name is Jose Antonio Vargas, but I'm Filipino, I'm not Latino, right? Um, I just kind of worked against so many stereotypes that people have about who we're supposed to be. And so, but it took me a while to really embrace, because I, I get this a lot. I hear from a lot of young dreamers who are like, you know, Jose, I support what you're doing, but I don't want people to think that they all have to be as smart and as successful as you. And you know, that is like, I can handle a lot. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, so I'm used to getting edited. <laughs> I can handle a lot of stuff. I can handle the Republicans, Lou Dobbs, O'Reilly. I can handle all that stuff. But when I'm here from, when I hear from dreamers and I hear that, something in me just like, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I think what this issue has done is rob us, and I'm using the word rob, the verb rob, of our own humanity. of the potential, of the fact that we come in all shapes and sizes, and we come in all sorts of dreams. Mm -hmm. That we're writers, we're doctors, we're lawyers, but most of us just want to be able to live lives with dignity, like you, right? And so I think at the end of the day, but here's the, and, you know, and this is the argument I made. When I was in Alabama, as far as they were concerned, I was Mexican. We didn't even have this model minority thing because they don't even know what the hell that is, right? That's a conversation that us economists, New Yorker, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's people can have. But the rest of America is not having that motherfucking con I'm sorry, are not having that conversation because we're all the same. And so it's really important, I think, and I'm, Rinko, I'm so glad you said that because the... The frames that we've used, even our friends or even the advocates, the fact that we have to, I remember the hardest thing I had to say when I first came out is, I'm sorry for breaking our country's laws. Mm -hmm. My friends made me say it. It took me a while and like, I actually like, at one point, like I remember like punching the wall, I was so mad. I have to say that I'm sorry, and I have to say it's our country, because I'm not gonna get anywhere talking to people in Ohio and Iowa and Arkansas and Kentucky and if I don't say that. Who's really my audience? Who really am I trying to talk to? There's so much that's happened already of us just talking amongst ourselves, you know, and not trying to figure out how can we meet people halfway without compromising our dignity. And I think, to me at least, that keeps me motivated. That keeps me, like one of the things we're gonna be doing starting August, I, I had a meeting with the co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, the largest Tea Party organization, and we're gonna co-host Tea Party Define American meetings, town hall meetings. I'm more than happy to come, um, you know, and see what happens. But to me, that's when change needs to happen. Us, you know, like us actually having these really hard conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think the immigration advocacy community, which has done such great work, need to be having these really hard conversations. Yeah, right? absolutely.